From CGTN headquarters in Beijing, this is The Hub with Wang Guan. Hello and welcome to The Hub. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. The impact of the conflict in Ukraine is felt across the world, including in Latin America and the Caribbean, with commodity prices soaring. Inflation is at its highest in 15 years, and the IMF predicts a sluggish year. It has already cut its growth estimates for the region for 2022 to 2.5%, from the 3% estimates earlier. Is it the, the end of the beginning or the beginning of the end for the region economic-wise? Will the 2020s be the new 1980s where we saw double-digit inflation rates and austerity plans? To discuss the challenges in the region and the implication for the rest of the world, I'm joined in Boston by Ambassador Jorge Heine, research professor at the Party School of Global Studies at Boston University. And here in Beijing by Professor Jiang Shixue, he's the director of the Center for Latin American Studies at Shanghai University. Uh, welcome, uh, gentlemen. Latin America is such a diverse region. Uh, it's not a monolithic whole. Uh, Jorge, uh, Ambassador Jorge Heine, you can tell me better. Uh, I want to ask you first, if you don't mind, about the economic consequences. We saw the outlook 2.5%, that is the projection made by the IMF. How do you foresee this translating into real impacts, tangible impacts on the Latin American people on the ground? Sure. Well, it's not good, certainly. Now, what is important to keep in mind is to put this in context. The region has been hit now by a real sort of wave of, of shocks in the past few years. In 2019, we had quite a number of protests uh, across uh, the countries on the Pacific, uh, in Chile, in Ecuador, in Colombia, also some in Bolivia. Uh, and that, you know, obviously brought quite a few problems. Then in 2020 and in, in 21, we had the pandemic. Uh, you may or may not know, but uh, Latin America has been really ground zero of the pandemic. At one point we had with 8% of the world's population, we had 30% of the pandemic's deaths. Uh, ECLAC, the Economic Commission for Latin America, said that this was the worst crisis in 120 years, ever since they have been, you know, having accounts. Um, GDP in the region in 2020 fell by 7.7%, which is twice as much as uh, the negative growth that the world economy as a whole had. And now we have, of course, the war in Ukraine. So it's been one blow after another, and the situation really very dire and people are having trouble making ends meet. There have been uh, demonstrations and, and uh, very uh, severe uh, riots in uh, Peru, and uh, we may see more of those things unless the situation improves. Yeah, uh, there are so, so many challenges. Uh, inflation is one of them. Professor Jiang, I want to ask you about inflation. We saw mm. high inflation rates due to soaring food and energy prices, uh, and we remember in the 1980s, right, when inflation uh, we're hitting the countries in the region. Is inflation back with a vengeance? Well, uh, I would uh, say that uh, inflation is not a, a kind of new phenomenon. I would say that the people over there uh, are very uh, accustomed to this kind of uh, uh, very rapid uh, rise of prices. As far as I know, uh, in, in, 19, uh, in 1983, the South American country called Bolivia suffered from hyperinflation. Will be 23,000. Can you imagine? 23,000. <laughs> Terrible. Wow. Okay. But since then, the prices have been uh, coming down and down. Well, uh, in the past uh, two years or so, because of the pandemic, you know, uh, because of the pandemic, so they. There is there there has been a kind of a shortage of supply. Okay, so when there is a shortage of supply, then if the demand cannot be cut down, naturally prices will rise. And now in the past two months, the war in Ukraine has some kind of negative impact on Latin America. So uh, as my friend Ho uh, has said just now, the regime is going to suffer another lost a decade because of the pandemic and the war. Well, uh, Ambassador Heine, what countries and industries uh, are you worried more or do you think they're more at risk at this point? 
Well, uh, you know, I was looking at the inflation uh, numbers and, uh, you know, after inflation from, um, you know, um, 2015 to 2017, 18 was around 4%. Last year it was 7%. Um, indications are this year it may be around 8 or 10%. Uh, Brazil has been hit particularly bad by inflation and some people say that, uh, you know, the, the re-election of President Bolsonaro is very much at risk because of inflation that has hurt uh, the Brazilian people uh, very badly. Uh, now, there, there's another thing here at play as well, and that has to do with the stimulus packages that were implemented by various countries in Chile and Brazil and elsewhere. And that was needed, of course. You need to, you know, kickstart the economy that was so badly hurt by the pandemic. But uh, you can have too much of a good thing, you know, and if you spend too much, well, uh, you also generate inflation. So it's important to keep, to keep that uh, in mind as well. Uh, Professor Jiang, are some countries in Latin America and the Caribbean more likely to cushion the blow than others? You know, uh, there are some oil exporting countries such as Venezuela and some major food and grain producers like Brazil. I mean, they're all different. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, so before I answer your question, like, can I, can sure, I sure, go ahead. One, uh, uh, just can I, can, can I add one point? Uh, well, uh, for the past uh, one or two decades, Venezuela is a, is a terrible country, you know. Uh, so, in, uh, so inflation over there is rising and rising. And uh, I think uh, for the time being, it's, it's more than 2,000% a year. Okay, so it's really very terrible. Now, your question. Well, I would say for some countries like uh, Mexico, Brazil, Ecuador, they, they sell uh, 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 all kinds of energies to the world market so they can get more uh, export incomes. However, at the same time, not all the sectors can get this kind of benefits, okay? So all the sectors must rely on energy to produce all kinds of things. So these sectors will suffer from the rise of the energy prices. That's why prices in Brazil and um, some other countries are rising very, very fast, okay? Now, uh, again, here I want to mention Mexico. Mexico might be a special case. Mexico is so close to the US. And in the U.S., the uh, prices rise uh, have been so high. So there's a kind of a negative impact from the inflation in the U.S. for Mexico. You know, Ambassador Helene, you talk about okay. uh, too much of yes. a good... Okay, go ahead. Do you want to comment on what Professor Zhang has said? Yes, yes. I just want to say the following. So there is a, a one sort of uh, optimistic or rosy reading, if you will, of the current situation in which it is said, well, the price of commodities are going up and therefore Latin American countries will benefit because you know, many of them uh, produce commodities, oil and uh, iron ore and copper and so on. And there is some truth to that. But it, it is really uh, not so rosy as it looks. First of all, uh, it, you know, some, some commodities uh, go up uh, but you have to, you know, make up for the inflation in other sectors. And for example, even in oil producing countries, uh, when the price of oil goes up significantly, which means that you get more uh, foreign currency, then you have to subsidize public transport because, you know, the price of fuel is also going up. So, you know, it's a bit of a double-edged uh, sword. And the other thing is, you know, another rosy reading is that uh, well, there may be another commodities boom, like there was from 2003 to 2013, which benefited the region very much. Well, that was a commodities boom that was driven in, in large part by uh, China's demand. This time, the situation is a bit different. You know, the price of commodities are going up because of a war, not because of uh, you know, Chinese demand, which mm. still exists, obviously, but it's mainly because of the war. So my feeling is I'm a bit more pessimistic and cautious. I think, I think things are pretty dire and we have to look for a way out. Ambassador Helen, I want to uh, follow up on that. Uh, you talked about uh, inflation and we know mm. that central banks across Latin America are lifting mm. interest rates to combat inflation. And do you think this will work or mm. will there be a similar situation 
uh, like that in the 1980s where we saw austerity measures, uh, currency devaluation, mm -hmm. and stock market and asset prices mm -hmm. crash. Well, I will say this. Um, as um, my good friend Yang Shishui said, uh, America, Latin America has gone through some severe bouts of inflation in the 60s and 70s and 80s, and it was really very bad. And in the 90s, there was a certain uh, agreement that you couldn't live like that, and you, you had to put your house in order and you know, fight inflation uh, as much as you could. And basically, that meant that inflation was tamed. So my view is that the last thing we need is to go back to those uh, inflationary periods. In that sense, it seems to me that the central banks, however painful it may be, need to do what they must do and curb inflation. And you know, one way of doing it, of course, is raising interest rates. Uh, one and last question. It's, it's a good thing. Right, right, right. One last question about the economics in Latin America. Mm -hmm. Professor Jiang, um, are we in for a recession mm -hmm. in Latin America and the Caribbean? How hard is it going to bite? Uh, sorry, can you say it again? I, Do you think there will be a, a recession of sort in Latin America, given all the external shocks and inflationary pressures there? Uh, yes, uh, my answer would be yes. You know, uh, in the past uh, two years, people are saying that Latin America is suffering from a kind of a twin, twin pandemic. Pandemic of COVID-19 and the pandemic of poverty. Now, the region is suffering from the so-called side uh, uh, effect of the war in Ukraine. So now we are going to see that uh, there will be a triple pandemic. Uh, so many people say that Latin America mm -hmm. is going to uh, suffer from another lost decade. So I think, uh, so I, I would agree with my colleague uh, Jorge that uh, I'm a little bit pessimistic. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there's one mm -hmm. chance that Latin America might uh, uh, will suffer less from this kind of triple pandemic if the region can have uh, some kind of cooperation with China. Talk about China-Latin America cooperation, which is uh, not without its controversy, to say the least. Uh, but Ambassador Helene, mm -hmm. let's talk about the social consequences yes. and yes. potential social fallout from the economic mm -hmm. challenges. You talk about sure. the civil unrest in Peru, mm -hmm. uh, while Ecuador saw violent mm -hmm. protests as well. The resentment is also growing in mm -hmm. Brazil and Argentina. How do you anticipate the mm -hmm. destabilizing mm -hmm. factors such as these? to develop in Latin America and the Caribbean? Well, no, it's, it, 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 yes, well, look, we have a, a case in point. The case in point is Chile. In Chile in 2019, in October, things got so bad that we had, you know, a social uprising uh, and churches were burned and supermarkets were looted, things that had never happened in Chile. Chile was considered the ultimate boring country where nothing ever happened <laughs> and suddenly we have this uh, social explosion so that gives you an indication if that can happen in chile it can happen anywhere chile is the most developed country in in south america with some of the highest educational standards long civic tradition strong democratic institutions it happened there so uh, it can happen anywhere the, the point i'm trying to make is that it is important for uh, latin american <laughs> governments to get their act together we are now in the process of change from the conservative governments that uh, were in power for a number of years, and there's a new wave of progressive governments that is uh, coming into power. And I hope they heed the lessons of the past, and they do what is needed to fight inequality, to come up with the adequate social programs, and uh, you know, uh, fight poverty. Poverty uh, reached an all-time high of 33%, one out of three Latin Americans was under the poverty line in 2020. Now that has come down now to 26%, I think it is, but it's still extremely high, and that is a real problem. And I just said, we, we are seeing this with the demonstrations that are taking place in uh, Peru that are, you know, very concerning. Yeah, inequality is another issue facing Latin America, right? Uh, Professor Jiang, by some measures, Latin America and the Caribbean is already the most unequal region or regions in the world. Uh, what social protection programs have been lined up so far? Is there a, 
a physically acceptable plan to perhaps support poorer or more vulnerable families? Well, uh, so can I just add one point sure. about Peru? Well, Peru uh, is a country which has been suffering from a political crisis and also economic crisis. You know, uh, I think the year before last year, uh, 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 there were there were three presidents within one week. It's it's, it's terrible. You know, there there are there were three presidents. Uh, within one week, okay, and of course uh, there are some mm. kind of constitutional problems, all kinds of things. And now, for your question, mm. yes, well, Latin America did a relatively good job uh, for the UN's uh, so-called Millennium Development Goal, uh, which was finished by the year 2015. And since then, the region has been working very hard for the so-called SDG 2030, okay? One of the targets for the mm -hmm. SDG Sustainable Development Goals is to cut poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, well, in this area, mm -hmm. America uh, will have a very, very hard job to achieve this kind of goal because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, and here again, I want to mention mm -hmm. China again, okay? So China can offer a certain kind of help for the region to fulfill its uh, 2030 SDG uh, goals. Uh, let's talk about China. Ambassador Heine, China's role in Latin America is controversial, like it or not. Uh, some in Washington accuse China of doing neocolonialism and uh, describing the Chinese investments there as uh, predatory investment behaviors. How do you look at those assertions? Well, I will say this. Uh, oh, what we have seen over the past uh, 20 years is an increased presence of China in Latin America. I will only give you uh, one number. Uh, total trade between China and Latin America in 2000 was $10 billion. In 2021, it was $451 billion. So, in 20 years, you had an increase of 45 times. You know, for South America as a whole, China is right now its number one trading partner, as it is for individual countries like Brazil, Uruguay, Chile, and Peru. Secondly, there has been a significant Chinese investment in the region. There's figures vary, but somewhere between 150 and 160 billion dollars in Chinese investment. There have also been significant financial flows. Uh, more or less along the same lines, probably 150, 160 billion dollars. Now, what this has meant is that uh, it has made a significant difference in, in Latin America. You know, people talk about uh, the China boom that took place in Latin America from 2003 to 2013, in which increased exports to China allowed the region to uh, pay off its debt, to increase its foreign exchange reserves, and uh, to apply all sorts of social programs. So, I would say that um, as a whole, in general terms, the increased uh, Chinese presence in Latin America has been uh, very beneficial. Uh, Professor Jiang, how would you describe or characterize China's role in Latin America? Well, if you can do a survey in Latin America, I would uh, say that uh, most of the people there will believe that China is an angel, not a devil, for its economic development. China has made lots of investment for the region uh, in infrastructures, in agriculture, manufacturing, tourism, all kinds of things. China has a very close trade relationship with the region. Okay? So, uh, and also in the past uh, several years, China has implemented uh, as uh, a Belt Road Initiative, okay? So I will say that uh, Latin America mm. has benefited greatly from China's uh, 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 the so-called economic uh, cooperation. Now, some people say that uh, can China be a white knight for Latin America because the region is suffering from the so-called triple pandemic? Well, I will say that China cannot be a white knight, but China can really be a big helping hand for the region to overcome the uh, triple effect of this uh, crisis we have mentioned just now. 
uh, Ambassador Heine, but we saw increasing. So, uh, I, yeah, go ahead. Yes. Ambassador Heine, go ahead. You know, I just wanted to say that, yes, what, what it seems to me has uh, generated a considerable interest in the region is the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, we just had President Fernandez of Argentina visit uh, China and sign the NMOU uh, of uh, Argentina uh, joining uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. With that, I think it's 21 countries in Latin America that have signed on to the Belt and Road Initiative. Why is it important? Because Belt and Road uh, can uh, contribute to develop the infrastructure and the connectivity that um, America, Latin America, and particularly South America, so badly needs. You know, uh, South America, much like China, has long distances, vast spaces, very high mountains, long rivers, and it badly needs to be connected. Internal, you know, connectivity within uh, South America is very underdeveloped. And I see enormous potential there. Five uh, South American countries have, uh, have become full members of the AIIB, the Asian Investment and Infrastructure Bank. And I see enormous potential there on working on things like the bio-oceanic corridors from the Atlantic to the uh, Pacific in developing uh, railways, developing highways, tunnels, bridges. These are areas in which Chinese construction companies have significant comparative advantages. They have done it in, in China very well. And um, I am excited about the possibility of them participating in developing our infrastructure. We're still a long way from there. Some things have been done, others haven't. We need more coordination. But that, it seems to me, is the way forward. Professor Zhang, do you want to add anything? Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, in China, uh, we take the so-called high-speed train, OK? It runs at 300 kilometers per hour. But at in least. Argentina, in Argentina, before China made its investment, in its railroad system, the train in Argentina runs at 30 kilometers per hour. It's one, one tenth of China's high speed train. Okay, so now China's investment helps Argentina to improve its railway system. And also in some other countries, China's investment has improved its infrastructures. And I believe that uh, with the further implementation of the BRI Belt Road, uh, Belt Road I was uh, say that uh, China will make more investment in this region. Yeah, but Ambassador Hanane, mm -hmm. we're okay. living in an era, like it or yes. not, where geopolitics are dictating terms, are, mm -hmm. are impacting uh, economic sure. policy making. Yes. You know, America, for example, uh, sure. singled out China for its BRI programs. I, I am fully uh, aware yeah. of that. And of sure. course, we've seen that over. Well, let the me years take. You, let me tell you. Give you. Sure. Let me give you my take on that. Uh, I, it's. It's. You're absolutely right. It's not an easy issue, and, and Latin America is being subjected to serious pressures uh, right now, and many countries are being subjected to serious pressures, and that is a reality. We cannot ignore it or pretend it does not exist. So let me tell you what I think our answer should be. Uh, with two colleagues, with uh, Carlos Fortin and Carlos Ominami. We have just published a book. Uh, it's called Active Non-Alignment for Latin America, a Doctrine for the 21st Century. And in this book, which was published in, in Chile in Spanish last November, will be published in English in London uh, later this year, uh, what we argue is that Latin American countries should not let themselves be pressured into siding either with Washington or with Beijing. That what they should do is look out for their own interest and say, this is what we need, this is what we're going to aim for, and that is what is going to happen. And it seems to me, you know, that this book has been reviewed very widely. We have launched it in half a dozen countries. It has generated an enormous debate. And, you know, there is a revival today. In, the, in today's world that we see it also with the war in, in Ukraine, there is a revival, there is a rebirth of the notion of non-alignment, that you don't have to take sides uh, between the superpowers. You look for your own way. And we call it active non-alignment. Why? Because we argue that it has to be a proactive attitude, looking for our own interests, not as a defensive position, but rather as an offensive active position, looking out for our own interests. And in today's world, you know, with uh, what has been called the emergence of the 
Asian century, the emergence of what some people refer to as a post-Western world, in which you know, the economic action has shifted from the North Atlantic to the uh, Asia Pacific, what the World Bank has called the wealth shift, the fact that there are more billionaires in Beijing than there are in New York City. That, it seems to me, uh, reflects the world we live in today and the possibilities that are open to Latin American countries. But Ambassador Helene, do you think active non-alignment can happen in the real world? Oh, of, well, let me tell you the following. It is already happening. This is what you know, uh, reviewers of the book have pointed out. Uh, let me give you an example. In, in December, uh, Washington, the US government, called for a meeting of something called the Summit of Democracies. And many Latin American countries were invited and participated. Now, a week before that, in Mexico City, something called the China Latin America Ministerial Forum at the level of foreign ministers took place. And many Latin American countries participated. And they saw no conflict in participating in Washington with the US government in the Summit of Democracies and participating in uh, Mexico City with Foreign Minister Wang Yi uh, on China Latin American relations. So it is already happening. And you look at, for example, the, the position that countries like Brazil and Argentina have taken on the issue of uh, the war in Ukraine. They have refused to back uh, the uh, suspension of uh, Russia in the uh, Human Rights Council. They refuse to back the suspension of Russia's observer status within the OAS. Between Mexico and Brazil, they, they make more than half the population of Latin America. You know? So it is already happening. It, it is not a question of some sort of utopian proposal. It is happening on the ground. That's beautiful. That's beautiful, I would say. Professor, Professor Zhang, uh, any final thoughts? Yeah, uh, I would uh, point out that the U.S. foreign policy towards Latin America is still based on the so-called Monroe Doctrine. Okay, so I would uh, uh, point out that, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, the U.S. does not need to be concerned over the uh, rapid growth, rapid, uh, rapid development of China's relationship, relationship with, uh, uh, so with the region. Uh, Chinese investment and trade with Latin America can promote rapid economic growth rate over there. Latin America will be more prosperous. A more prosperous Latin America is beneficial to the U.S. There will be less illegal drug trafficking. There will be less illegal migration. So the U.S. should be grateful to China, not to be angry with China. Yeah, I hope the, the messages will be heard Good. by Good. the policymakers, by the congressmen, by the representatives, the senators in Washington, D.C., but given the circumstances we're living in and given the fact that the midterm elections are only a few months away, I doubt that that will happen. Um, I don't know. I can be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. But thank you so much, Professor Jiang Shixue and Ambassador Jorge Hainé. I learned so much from you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Come back thank again, you. please. Thank you. Bye. 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 And thank you, our viewers, for tuning in at this hour. And that will do it for this edition of The Hub on CGTN. What you think matters. Send us a message on Weibo, Douyin, or Twitter, or other social media platforms. Thank you for joining us. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. Our news coverage continues. Bye and take care.